Good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the executive director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to an excellent conversation between author and journalist Eric Garcia and award-winning science writer and FAN favorite Steve Silberman. Thank you for attending. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high-quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among others. We have over 175 videos of past events archived on our YouTube channel and website, so please be sure to explore. And now for formal introductions. Eric Garcia is a senior Washington correspondent at The Independent and the author of We're Not Broken, Changing the Autism Conversation. He has worked as an assistant editor at the Washington Post Outlook section and wrote regularly for the paper and as an associate editor at The Hill. He has also worked at Roll Call, where he interviewed elected officials ranging uh, from Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren and Market Watch, where he covered financial regulation. Mr. Garcia has written extensively about autism and disability rights for National Journal Daily, The Washington Post, NBC's Think, and The Daily Beast. Prior to his time in journalism, Mr. Garcia interned at the White House during the Obama administration. Steve Silberman, who is last on the fan stage in 2015, is an award-winning science writer whose articles have appeared in Wired, The New York Times, The New Yorker, The Financial Times, The Boston Globe, The MIT Technology Review, Nature, Salon, Shambhala Sun, and many other publications. He is the author of Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity, a widely praised bestseller in the United States and in the United Kingdom. Neurotribes, I have it up here too. Neurotribes <laughs> won the 2015 Samuel Johnson Prize for nonfiction, and it was chosen as one of the best books of 2015 by the New York Times, The Economist, The Financial Times, The Boston Globe, The Independent, and others. And it has been translated into 23 languages. That might be old though. Maybe Steve's got a new number. Maybe it's more than 23 now. It's 25 now. 25, but who's counting? Oh! Who's counting? <laughs> it was just published in Polish this week. There you go. Nice. <laughs> Hold on, I'm, I'm not, I got two more sentences. Yeah. In 2016, Mr. Silberman gave the keynote speech at the United Nations for World Autism Awareness Day. His TED talk, The Forgotten History of Autism, has been viewed nearly 2 million times and translated into 25 languages. He is one of my favorite human beings in the world, P.S. A <laughs> complete mensch, a dear man. And now let's welcome Eric Garcia and Steve Silberman. Thank you so much, Lonnie. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here and I'm so honored to be here with Eric. Thank you to my friend, my mentor, my inspiration, the intellectual rock on which I built this house. That is my book. Wow. And thank you to Fan. Thank you to Lonnie. Thank you to everyone. And thank you to the city of Chicago. I am a native of Chicagoland, Skokie, Illinois. I am a son of Skokie, Illinois. And everything I do is influenced by that. That is why I have a deep and abiding love of the Chicago Cubs the blues and Polish sausage. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Um, let's just plunge right in. Um, <laughs> perhaps we can tell this, the amazing story of how we met. Uh, yes, in person yes. Later on. yes, but let's, let's just get right into the meat of things. Um, Eric, generally speaking, as you and I both know, most books about autism are written by non-autistic people, neurotypicals often mm -hmm. clinicians and parents, unless they're personal memoirs like John Elder Robeson's Look Me in the Eye. Even my own book was written by an alleged neurotypical. Um, what is the historical significance of you, a member of what you call the spectrum generation, writing a book about autism that goes beyond your own lived experience to include statements and positions on public policy and education? Right, so I think it's important. I think I would, without puffing myself up, I think it's important because while plenty of people came before me and wrote plenty of important memoirs, whether it was John Elder Robeson or Temple Grandin or the late Donna Williams, God rest her soul, um, there haven't been many books that have contextualized the autistic experience. And I think as a journalist, and you're a journalist, you know, you've been a journalist for a long time, you know that our stories don't exist in a vacuum. They are 
part of a larger tapestry. How we rise and how we fall are not just the consequences of individual choices. They are a product of all that came before us, all that is around us, and they will shape what comes after us. And I'm a political journalist. I had no intention ever of writing about autism. I was perfectly happy being an economics reporter uh, back in summer of 2015. That was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I had a pretty good life interviewing Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, well, trying to catch her Elizabeth Warren. She would not talk to me back then. Uh, you, you know, I had a good life. And, but what I realized when I decided to start to write about autism was I realized that, A, my story wasn't the complete story about autism. And as a journalist, I felt that was unacceptable. My impulse is to report and to write and to be curious and go, huh, why? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was I recognized the, once I wrote my initial story for National Journal and it blew up, one of the things I noticed was I got to meet so many incredible autistic people or many autistic people began to email me and so many of them didn't have the same opportunities I did. And many of them were smarter than me or harder working than I am or were kinder or more good and decent people. So that led me to think, how did this happen? And also, if we've had so many bad ideas about autism, that must mean that we have pretty bad policies about autism. So I felt that it was important to place my story within the larger narrative of autism and show why my existence is not sui generis. It is a product of so many deliberate decisions and unconscious decisions. Excellent, thank you. Um, and you know, you just talked about your very existence and you say in the book that your very quote, your very existence contradicts what many people believe about autism. If you could talk about some of the myths of autism that you feel have caused the most harm to autistic people and their families over the decades. Certainly, I think, well, let's start with the biggest one. And that is the idea that vaccines cause autism. Um, let's put that out right in front. That is unadulterated lies and untrue. And it has caused countless people to suffer. But let's get to the, let's go to the bigger root of it, which is that why are people afraid of vaccinating their kids? And why are people afraid of their children becoming autistic? They are afraid of their children becoming autistic because they have been told that autism is a death sentence. They have been told that it is worse than death. They have been told that it is better for your child to die of measles than it is for them to live with autism, that their life is not worth living. The other myths that your book so wonderfully articulated was the uh, terrible myths that Bruno Bettelheim spread that uh, it was caused by unloving mothers. I believe in your book, probably one of the most disturbing things was he compared autistic people to the conditions in Auschwitz and the uh, concentration camps. The other thing was of course that we had a very, very limited idea of who could be autistic. Uh, Leo Connor, who did research uh, in Baltimore, about two hours away from where I live. His first real research was, as you know, of nine Anglo-Saxon children and two Jewish children. Eight of them were boys and three of them were girls. Conversely, over in Nazi-occupied Vienna, Hans Asperger um, initially didn't believe that girls could be autistic. So what has happened is we have seen that we have a very, very narrow view, not only of who autistic people could be, but what autistic people can do and where they belong in the world. And that has led us to have very harmful ideas. That is what is the underlying driver of why people subject autistic people to shock therapy. That is why so many parents get lax sentences when they murder their autistic children. That is the rationale for paying autistic people below minimum wage and arguing that they belong in institutions and that they cannot live 
full and good and meaningful lives within their communities. So these policies are the bad fruit, are, are the rotten fruit of bad ideas, so to speak. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I'm gonna agree with you and, and add something as well. I think that the notion that autistic people do not have empathy yes. is also, and, and don't want to have friends or want to love their parents, I think that that dehumanized autistic people in the public mind to the point where they're willing to accept not even shock therapy uh, at the Judge Rottenberg Center, it's punishment. It's yes. painful electric shocks as punishment. Yes. And, and one of the things that I didn't have room for in my book, unfortunately, was that I talked to a psychotherapist who went to the Judge Rottenberg Center because he wanted to be open-minded and see what was going on. And he asked to receive the shock. And yes. uh, he was skeptical that it was, you know, would be so bad. It was hell. It was yes. absolute hell. And the only way that that kind of uh, treatment would be acceptable would be if the people being treated were not considered human. Yes. And, and the notion that autistic people are not quite human or missing the thing that yes. makes people human, I think that's also done tremendous amount of damage. Certainly, and I believe that it was Ola Ivar Lovas who said the autistic people are not even human in the way that we consider them human. I'm, I'm butchering his actual words, but- He said would... you have to build a person. Yes, yes, yeah. that, is yeah. that is what he said. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it is, uh, and that underlying idea that autistic people are not people, you can only dehumanize someone if you do not see them as people. You can only treat them as subhuman if you do not see them as part of your fellow human, part of the fellow human race. And the idea that autistic people are unempathetic or that they don't know how to express love uh, you know, that you, you had a whole part, that was part of the reason why Jim Sinclair said, don't mourn for us, you know, is because he, uh, th they had seen, uh, pardon, pardon me, I misgendered, but they had seen the um, parents express sadness that their child would never say that they love them. But the truth is, is that your child does know how to say they love you. It is on you to, um, to learn how to speak it. The way that I put it is that if you were going to a foreign country and you tried to force other people to speak the language that you were saying, you would be seen as a rude, ignorant, ugly American. But for some reason, we do not see, and I, I'm paraphrasing the late Mel Baggs here, that we don't see that, that we don't consider the way that autistic people can communicate as fully human. And that is... Um, heartbreaking and that is a it should be a damning testimony for who we are the fact that the united nations special rapporteur on torture calls the judge on rick center a violation of human rights should be a damning indictment of the united states of america that we continue to do this indeed indeed now uh, eric you mentioned earlier the um the bogus theory that vaccines cause autism, which was advanced by Andrew Wakefield in a mm -hmm. thoroughly corrupt, debunked, retracted study. Um, I'd be curious uh, for your reflections on how the sort of social media ecosystem that arose to support that now debunked idea laid the groundwork for the disinformation ecosystem that we're in now that's persuading people not to get vaccines or not to wear masks. Um, it is, you know, and I, I've used this analogy with you a few times, and I use it on social media all the time. The vaccine panic that happened from the 1990s to, to, to really until the study was retracted even today is to the current COVID vaccine, Michigas, what the hobbitists of the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, no. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the anti-vaccine skeptics, I believe read, I was reading an article in the New York Times earlier this uh, a few weeks ago, saying that, in fact, anti-vaxxers saw the COVID-19 pandemic as their opportunity to capitalize on people's, I, I, I'm sure you probably read that same article, or, or if not, I'll probably text it to you later. Um, they saw this as an opportunity. They saw this as the ability, as the chance to 
sees uh, to, to, to win a political argument. And you could argue, and I, 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 at the risk of being hyperbolic, I would argue that they've made a major victory mm. by creating enough of a segment of the culture war to and hitching their wagon to the American right, to a big part of the American right, um, that they that we cannot get herd immunity. They, but that wouldn't exist. That initial skepticism, that, that initial unwillingness wouldn't exist had that foundation not been laid by fear mongering about vaccines causing autism. And it's why you see plenty of women unwilling to take to get vaccinated because anti-vaccine, as you know, the anti-vaccine myths existed largely on parent blogs and mom blogs and in women's internet spaces. There was a great thing uh, in your in the magazine used to work for Wired about uh, the term pastel colored QAnon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. th- that, yeah. that, that is a terrifying yes. discovery, but it's also incredibly accurate. Right. We wouldn't live in this dystopian hellscape yeah. if it weren't for the anti-vaxxers laying that groundwork. And of yeah. course, they found a champion in the last president of the United States. And it's not a mistake that Donald Trump um, promoted these ideas and that the person who gave him a lot of these ideas was Bob Wright and the Wright family and Katie Wright. That's not a coincidence that he became the most vocal uh peddler of myths about that autism and vaccines and for people who don't know bob and katie wright founded autism speaks yes which is the primary you know it's the main autism charity in america yes. and they were founded to cure autism yes uh founded by anti-vaxxers um trump was very deeply involved in anti-vax uh something i found out through my own research was that the landlord of his campaign headquarters in Florida is a major anti-vaxxer. Yes, yes, I, I know, yeah, yeah. Gary Kompothakras. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's not an accident. And of course, Bob and Katie Wright, Bob, Bob and Suzanne Wright, Bob Wright was running NBC when he launched The Apprentice, you know? Right, right. So, so there is yeah. this weird kind of um, tornado of right. misinformation that we can attribute to that uh, unholy alliance. But let's talk about that. Mm-hmm. You know, let's talk about the fact that autistic people have not been at the table. Mm-hmm. And that is, you know, we can, I could talk, I could talk all night about Donald Trump, but he wouldn't be, but the way that Donald Trump, as we know, Trump doesn't get these ideas from out of nowhere. He gets them from channels, he gets them from Fox News, he gets them from watching TV. He wouldn't have gotten that if we hadn't, if there hadn't been a pre-existing scheme of what autism is like and why it's such a scary thing and why it wasn't. And it's it's terrifying because we don't actually, uh, because autistic people were excluded for so long that the Wright family and Bernard Rimland, even though he had some good ideas back in the 60s and 70s, he kind of went off the rails later on and he, he helped promote this, this funk idea. Uh, you know, the fact that the reason why Trump could promote this is that because for so long we didn't have autistic people saying that we just we weren't we weren't the authors of our own lives. We weren't given the permission to, you know, control the narrative. Yeah. And I think that's the most important thing is that we weren't we didn't have we weren't given that agency and we weren't afforded that. Yep. Got it. Um, in better news. Uh, the, the the last few years have been very distressing uh, in many ways. Yes. We've also seen some real breakthroughs in the representation yes. of autistic people in media. I'm thinking of films like Pixar's Loop, The yes. Reason I Jump, uh, and the up and an upcoming film which is amazing, which I've seen already, called This Is Not About Me. All of which portray the experiences of non-speaking autistic people yes. with honesty and compassion. I'm also thinking of autistic comedian Hannah Gadsby's Douglas, which contains some of the most forceful arguments for honoring neurodiversity that I've ever heard. In the midst of a very dark time, progress is being made in the area of autistic representation. What accounts for that? 
I think it just accounts for the fact that, again, this didn't happen on accident. This was a deliberate thing. What happened is in the 1980s and the 1990s, we expanded the autistic diagnostic criteria so more people could get diagnosed. But I would argue just as important is the United States made some very, very specific policy tweaks that enabled for people to get that. It's one thing to have, as you know, the spirit of a diagnosis. It's another thing to get the diagnosis to the people. Uh, in 1990, Congress passed, uh, Congress reauthorized what was then the Education for Handicapped Children Act as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And this was crucially important because what it did is it required, uh, is it essentially required public schools, it included autism for the first time it included autism in uh, disability. It wasn't seen as a form of brain damage. It wasn't seen as a form of mental illness. It was seen as a disability. So what does that mean? It meant that students with students who were autistic were entitled to certain things. They were entitled to a free appropriate public education. And as such, what that meant is that schools now had to report to the federal government how many autistic people there were. So as a result, even though I want to be perfectly clear, the IDEA was not the windfall it would have been. It was supposed, the federal government was supposed to fund 40% of IDEA. It's only funded ever around like 14%, 14, 15% on average. But those small incremental changes led to more people getting diagnosed, getting more services. Now, of course, in the 1990s and the 2000s, we had a moral panic about, oh my God, the vaccine, the, the, the autism rate is skyrocketing. It's an epidemic. Must it be the vaccine? But the flip side of this, and this is why I get specifically so mad about Andrew Wakefield and his, um, his moral turpitude, is that there was a is that we had this increase in people and we had many people who got services and we should have listened to these people but now what's happened is that you know i turned 30 in december the idea was passed and the americans with disabilities act passed the year i was born now we have autistic people who are growing up now we have people like Hari Srinivasan, who sits on the federal government's advisory committee and is a limited speaking autistic, uh, autistic person with limited speaking capacity. We have, uh, or even Ova, we have uh, even Ova Smith, who is also on that, uh, an autistic person with an intellectual disability. And in the same way, now you have autistic people who can, uh, you know, you know, like do things like the reason I jump. And you can have uh, Erica Milsom, who lives in the Bay Area, cast Madison Bandy to play that. That would be a not, young black woman. A yeah. young black woman, yes. Yeah, exactly, yes. That, that yeah. again, the, and, and again, the diagnostic gap, it's still bad, but it's, it's, it's still not what we would like it, but it's closing. Uh, yeah. That wouldn't be possible were it not for specific policy tweaks. And yeah. now, as Anybody knows that anytime a marginalized group gets even a measure of some type of their rights, even a half loaf, what happens is that as they grow up, they demand more. Uh, and, and that's a great thing. They demand their full, they demand the rest of the loaf. So that's what's happened is that it, it's not that it's that David Perry, who you know, and you and I both follow on Twitter, he asked me, he said, how have autistic people been able to win the culture war lately? And I, I argue they've not won the culture war lately, but what's happened is that now you can't talk about autism without expecting us to talk back, you know? Right, absolutely. So that, that, um, that's the best yeah. And in fact, when I was writing Neurotribes, as I've said on Twitter, I imagined that someday so, some autistic person would write a book about the history of autism from their perspective, and that is you. So thank you for doing that. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah. Uh, there was recently a huge uh, controversy on Twitter about a research project in England into the genetics of autism yes. called Spectrum 12K, 10K. which has been paused over concerns that the information would be used to prevent autistic people from being born in the future. In other words, eugenics. Yes. Over the past couple of decades, the United States has spent literally billions of dollars yes. on similar research. If that money is not going to the right kinds of research, where should it be going? And how can we, as both autistic people and neurotypical allies, help get it there? So let's start with one of the biggest things that I argue, which is that um, the biggest killers for 
autistic people, the biggest killer for autistic people with intellectual disabilities is epilepsy. People dying from epileptic seizures. Conversely, the biggest killers for autistic people without intellectual disabilities are circulatory conditions like heart disease, followed by suicide. Um, on top of that, so, so, you know, a lot of people, when they, when I say that we should accept autism, they think that I mean that, you know, we should accept all the good and the bad. No, I think it's a disability. I believe it's a disability and it comes with impairments. Let's focus on those impairments. Let's focus on those things, but let's not try to fundamentally alter them under also alter who autistic people are. Let's focus on the things that really do cause harm and pain for autistic people while also maximizing their potential. Let's also note that many of that autistic people have some of the lowest unemployment rates even among their fellow disabled people, and even among people with intellectual disabilities and other types of dis developmental disabilities, they have a lower unemployment rate. Employment they, rate, I think. No? Uh, employment rate, yes, yes, yes. you're right. Yeah, yeah. They have a lower employment mm -hmm. rate. Yeah, that's what yeah. I meant. Yeah. Um, and then also, let's, take, let's even take a step back there. Um, there are employers who employ autistic people, but they don't know they, don't, they employ autistic people. Eric, hold on one second. Um, I'm sorry. No, you didn't do anything wrong. Steve, I think, uh, will come right back in. So let's just wait one second for him to come back in. Maybe okay. he had some kind of glitch on his end. So we'll just wait for him to come back in. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, hold on one second. I'm going to mute myself. There he is. Oh. Oh. Let's see what's going on. Hi. Hi. Hey. Sorry. Sorry. I'm back. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what happened. It I just froze. Happened. That's okay. Yeah, don't worry. So, but, but, uh, but, 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 you know, there's a racial and gender gap. Let's focus on that. Let's focus on the fact, and let's focus on the fact that a lot of employers don't realize that they're employing autistic people. And a lot of autistic people, you know, something that I talked to the New York Times about, I haven't seen a lot of research on autism and burnout. Um, yeah, absolutely. That is something that a lot of autistic people deal with. Uh, we are not focusing on, we're not doing research on what can be done to ensure that autistic people can live in their communities because we know that autistic people who live in the community have a better life expectancy rate uh autistic people they have better health their families are better off than if they're you know sheltered away in institutions or group homes or things like that we haven't seen we haven't done a lot of research into that we haven't done a lot of research into what the best services are uh we don't really know there was a gao report that i was looking at a few months ago showing suggesting that we should probably be looking at the transition from childhood to adulthood um, a little bit earlier in high school. Why? But we aren't really focusing on that. There are a lot of things we could be focusing and spending a lot of money on. Uh, the, the, the federal government, we spend, you know, in 2016, I think something like $360 million was spent on autism research between the public and the private sector. And that's a lot of money. And the United States is also the biggest spender on autism research. So what we do, um, affects everything else and it will dict and it dictates what the united kingdom australia a lot of other countries will research so we are the trendsetters the united states is the trendsetter so when we say these are the priorities and these are our values that dictates what every other country is going to do and i don't think you would have the spectrum 10k stuff had you not seen years of research and focus into genetics and biology stateside that's great. Uh, and I think that, uh, as you mentioned earlier, now that there are uh, uh, even non-speaking and intellectually disabled autistic people on the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, uh, it will be nice to see autistic input into the research agenda. Yeah, and they probably have better insights to what their respective communities need than I do. So, And that's what we need. That's what we expect. We would consider it we would consider it glib, and we do consider it glib when there is a all white male panel on diversity. Right, exactly. But for some yes. reason, we think it's acceptable to talk about autism while talking past autistic people, you know? Yeah, indeed. And um, let me ask you uh, since you just mentioned, um, you know, diversity committees of white people, I'm curious if you have ever experienced racism. Uh, for being a person of color in autistic spaces? Thankfully, no. Great. I. That's not to say it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. 
That's not to say that I haven't. There haven't been individual people who might who might be autistic who I don't mm -hmm. know. Autistic. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. that I don't experience. But mm -hmm. I would say that there has not been individual racism. But mm -hmm. I do think that it's important to note that there still is a lack of leadership voices, mm. of leadership by people of color, by queer people, by uh, indigenous people, by a lot of other groups. So I would say that while I myself might not have experienced racism, that doesn't mean that there isn't still a problem within the systems and structures. Um, Excellent, and that, that's yes. So, so, you know. You know all yeah. about this. It's racism and ableism and homophobia and trans. I am not sure what's happening, folks. Um, Eric, I don't know if you oh. can hear it. Can you hear? Okay, so you're good. So Steve is going back out and coming back in. Um, you froze on my screen, Eric. I'm sorry. Oh, no, don't apologize. It's not your fault. So we'll get Steve right back here. And don't worry. Sorry, but sorry about that. Steve, I'm not sure. I don't think it's you. I don't think anyone needs to apologize. It's just okay. you know, Zoom, Zoom, Ether world. Uh, can you okay. could you turn your camera on for us, though? Yes. Okay. Am I back? Yeah, yes. you are back. Yes, on great. My screen, okay. so can I just interrupt for one second? So, Steve, on yeah. your screen, was it Eric who froze? No, it was. It, oh, I'm sorry. It was Eric who froze. It was yes. Eric who froze. Yeah. So I don't think yeah. you need to necessarily exit at that point, Steve, because I'm because he actually unfroze after a few seconds. Oh, okay, and all right. For, for viewers at home, in the final video that we post on YouTube and that we send out to folks, our AV person will clip out me talking and all these interruptions. So it'll be smooth in the final video. So okay, I will great. Now, I'm now disappearing again. <laughs> Thank you, Lonnie. Okay. Um, Eric, you mentioned earlier uh, Mel Bags, the late Mel Bags. Yes, uh, and uh I want to use a story that you've told in interviews um, to address a very naughty question, uh, both within the autism community and outside of the autism community. Yes. One of, one of the phrases that is commonly used in describing autistic people, or two of the phrases that I do not use, are high functioning and low functioning. Yes. Um, and there is a, I would say there's even a movement really to try to insist that the spectrum is not unified, that it's actually, we're talking about different, not just different people, but different conditions. Um, and you, however, related to Mel Bags when you saw their video. Yes. Was it the video called In My Language or In yes. My Own Language? Yes. And what, you know, Mel Bags was not necessarily the way, not necessarily behaving in ways that you would have behaved in an editorial meeting at roll call or something. Yeah. You know? So what was it that you related to about Mel Baggs stimming and humming? And, the, the first you know. time I saw Mel Baggs wasn't in, in my language. It was in mm -hmm. when I was a teenager. I had to be 16. Yeah, time-wise, time -wise, I had to be 16. Um, and that was when um, I saw them uh, stimming and moving and communicating in an interview with Dr. Sanjay Gupta on CNN. Mm. And what fascinated me was, it was as if we were, we had a similar language. It was almost like as if autism was Latin, but I was speaking Spanish and they mm. were speaking Italian mm. or they were speaking French, but we mm. had this similar root. Mm. And I remember my mom saying, can you please change the channel? Because, um, you know, it reminds me of when you were bullied a lot. And oh, that's right. interesting in and of itself, too, that, it is, yeah. that uh, you know, even though Mel Bags and I were different, my mom saw the, the similarities. But I just couldn't, probably one of the times I don't, I don't regret disobeying my mother, I just couldn't change the channel. I just, I was mm. sucked in and I couldn't look away. And uh, that was... It, it, it showed me that we had so many similarities that the the ways that we communicated in the world and moved through the world while might while maybe not the same they still we soothed ourselves and we rocked back and forth in the ways you, you know and, and, and then later on when 
you know, I actually didn't watch In My Language until Mel passed away. Mm. And then when I did, uh, I watched and, you know, like one of the things I noticed is that they put their face against uh, a page of a book. And I right now, I'm, I'm so that when I read an excerpt, I, I'm, you know, bookmarking with my middle finger. And it feels damn good to put your, to rub your hand against a, it's a form of stimming. And it feels incredible to, to, to run your fingers through a book ch chapter. And in that moment, what I realized was I realized that the gulf that so many people say exists between um, the late Mel Baggs and I immediately. Yeah, that's great. And, and from being a canyon to being like, you know, a little gorge skipping a hop on a river, you know? Yeah, that's great. Do you have any passages in your book that you might like to read about relating to other autistic people? Yes, I do, in fact. And thank you for the setup. Um, so this is a this is from when I interviewed and spoke with uh, John Marble, who you know very well, who wonderful guy. For those who don't know, John Marble was the second openly autistic presidential appointee. He got beat up by Ari Neman, who we also know, uh, and he now works in the Bay Area trying to help autistic people find work. But um, this is from this is from my chapter on work, so very fitting. The more I talk to and interview autistic people, the more I am reminded of an analogy that John Marble often uses. He likens being autistic to being French. There's millions of different ways to be French. In a gay fashion designer in Paris and a Catholic nun in Bordeaux are going to be radically different, he said, but they still understand each other as French. Marble notes that if you put autistic people in a room without any neurotypical people, their communication radically alters. I have noticed this in my own interactions with autistic people. We feel less fear and anxiety about stimming. We allow each other to ramble about our favorite subjects. We indulge each other and go back and forth, sometimes in conversations and sometimes literally rocking back and forth. In the workplace, autistic people generally do not have this luxury of understanding. Some employers' expectations are set too low. They don't think we'll, we will be worth the effort expended on accommodations. Just as problematic, some employers set the bar impossibly high, exper expecting autistic workers to be their secret sauce. Rarely are we afforded the chance to be normal, to navigate workplace politics, to be ourselves, to con and simply contribute as we see fit. Like in so many different areas, autistic people at work are constantly adjusting themselves not to our own expectations, but to the expectations of the outside world. So that is that's excellent. Yeah. So let's you and I fix the world right now. Yeah. How could employers provide accommodations to autistic employees so that they have as as good a chance of success as they could possibly have? Listen to autistic people. The the thing. A, a, you know, you spoke at Square and what Square, what I actually like about Square is that before they thought about hiring autistic people, they realized we have autistic people here. So let's right. include them in the decision-making process. Right. Whether you know it or not, autistic people are in every single profession. One of the things I noticed when I, when I, I live in, so I live in Washington, D.C., where there are plenty of different types. There's the stereotypical computer nerds. A lot of them work at the Defense Department or are computer programmers at the CIA. But there are also plenty of autistic people in the military. There are lawyers. There are, uh, you know, there are journalists. There are people on Capitol Hill. Even occasionally when I'm talking to members of Congress, sometimes when I turn off the recorder and I walk away, I'm like, oh, <laughs> Mm. Yeah, you're Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but but you know, that's neither here nor there. Include autistic people in the hiring and the recruiting process. Include autistic people in how you bring in autistic people, and find ways to make it so that there's this assumption that you, that if you hire an autistic person, they're going to be happy in that job in perpetuity. When you would never expect that from a neurotypical person. We would expect neurotypical, we would want to help neurotypical, we want to help neurotypical people if they become, so my mom worked in retail for a long time. So I'm just using this as an example. My mom started as a floor retail worker at Macy, you know, at Robinson's Man, then Macy's making minimum wage. By the end of it, she, you know, managed part of a floor in men's suits. 
but it was because they saw the potential in my mom that they realized, hey, she'd be great, you know, managing men's suits or children or the kids department or something like that. But we don't think that we just think we don't think that for autistic people. We just think that, okay, they're going to be happy doing this. So we don't also consider, well, what happens when autistic people want to grow? What happens when they want to manage things? We don't think of autistic people as managers because we think that they, again, to your point, we don't think of them as empathetic or having the people skills when there are plenty of autistic managers, um, you, you know, so we need to ensure that autistic people are included in the decision-making process before we do any major kind of hiring initiatives for autistic people. And, and God bless, there are some great companies that are doing them. SAB, Microsoft, some are doing better than others. But before then, clean your house before you welcome people into your house. And, ensure the, and allow the autistic people to see where there's the dirt and the grime and point it out to you and listen to them and get the, get the feed and listen to the feedback and take it constructively. That's great. Thank you, Eric. I mean, I ask you a question that uh, I got uh, from someone who may be listening today. And it's, it's, a, it's a really profound question. How best to talk to siblings about their brother's autism? That's from Natalie. Oh, this is a good question. How to talk with the so so how to talk with siblings how to talk with siblings about their siblings autism yes I think what you say is I, I I you know my I have a younger sister one of the things that my mom my my sister is eleven for understanding my sister's eleven months younger than I am so we basically grew up together uh, and we're incredibly close if you want to know how close we are I walked my sister down the aisle when she got married oh wow yeah. One thing that my mom did was that she said that, look, I function in a, in a different way than your, that, than, than, you know, my sister does, but that doesn't make either of us less intelligent or less worthy or more than the other. We just function in completely different ways and we move through the world in completely different ways, but that's not, uh, that doesn't make one better than the other or uh, or, or, or less than the other and in different ways. And my mom was always really, really deliberate in saying that like, yes, I may give you more attention here on, on this one thing, but on the other end, I give your sister attention on here on another thing. And what she did is that she recognized that just because one of us was neurotypical and one of us was autistic, that didn't mean that, that she was neglecting one or the other. It was that she recognized that different children had different needs and different, in. And also, I think what she taught us was that as, uh, since I'm her older brother, that I have certain responsibilities toward her. And as my sister, she had certain responsibilities toward me. And what it did is it created this sense of mutual respect. Now, that's not to say that my sister and I didn't fight like brother and sister, you know, like right. brother and sisters do, uh, especially when you're 11 months apart. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> But, you know, that doesn't mean that, but, but in the same respect, we, we understood from a baseline that we were equal and that we were both, that our parents loved us for who we were. That's great. Yeah. Um, and then another question, um, what would you say to a very bright 19 year old young man who was just diagnosed as autistic? Welcome first. I would say, I hope that this gives you clarity because one of the things that I think about a lot is that clinicians aren't the only people who give um, diagnostic labels, are they? The ones on the playground can be just as brutal as anything a, a clinician. Indeed. Um, and you don't oftentimes, you don't know that when you're six to 15, you don't care what the piece of paper says. You just know that you don't belong. But what I hope you recognize is that when you get this diagnosis, that it gives you clarity. You just have, as you said specifically, you just have a different operating system. That you just move through the world in a different way, and you have a different language, and you have a different, you have a different way of moving about. But that doesn't make you any less. And the thing I would also say is that even if you feel alone, if you feel like in your own community there's not many of other autistic people. There are plenty, you're not alone, that we have, that you are part of a wonderful 
neurotribe, if I may, um, <laughs> and a family and a kinship. And that even though we are all autistic in different ways and our autism and our autism is as much affected, you know, it's funny, I, I think about it, it's like people say like, oh, people say like, how are you, you know, you write about how you're affected by autism. I'm like, I affect autism as much as autism affects me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line. Yeah. But, but, you know, we, we're all different and we all do it. But in the same respect, we do have that commonality. And we do have this tie that binds us and this thread and this fabric. And I hope that whenever you feel alone, that you recognize that you belong and you have other people like you and you have an, and that if you have a family at home that loves you, great. But now you have another family. You have another, you have another group of people who understand you and who love you. And one thing that I hope comes through in my book I was just thinking about this the other day. There are plenty of people who can who can understand different things or take away different things from my book. One thing I want people to take away, I hope people understand, is how much I love autistic people. Um, I hope that that bleeds through in every page. It's how much I love autistic people. That's wonderful. Um, we're going to go to questions uh, from the audience and Lonnie in a moment. Um, I just have one last uh, question for you now. Sure. Um, what secret thing do you wish you could tell your neurotypical friends about hey how they could be a better friend to you and other autistic people um uh, make sure so i live in washington dc where there's a lot of humidity when we get together can we please not from the months of like may to august can we please get together inside once we're all if we're all vaccinated because i think that that contributes to burnout oh, i think the other one is more importantly, it'd be that I may not always understand what I said or did you, or, 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 or I may not understand how I make you feel in the moment, but that doesn't mean that you're, that I don't consider your feelings valid and that I don't want to, and that I don't think your voice is important and what you think it feels important. So please let me know because I want to be a friend you can depend on. And I want you to know that you can articulate how you feel to me as straightforward and that if I hurt you, let me know. If I say something that makes you feel good or if I do something that's good, you know, let me know too so that I can keep doing that. You know, um, one of the things I learned is like when I learned that one of my friends, what her favorite candy is, like that's something that I always make sure or what their, her favorite topping on pizza is. Now, whenever I have friends over for pizza, we're gonna have that topping on pizza. So let me know because I want to be, I want to be a part of your world and I want you to recognize that just as I want you to recognize my feelings as valid, I want to recognize your feelings as valid. Thank you. Lonnie? Excellent. Thanks for a great conversation between the two of you. It was, um, I know, very stimulating. I've been getting some texts from folks saying that they were, they're just uh, so excited to have tuned in. So a quick reminder, we are doing an after hours event right after this that's going to begin at about 8.05. We're going to give these two nice gentlemen a five minute break in between this and the after hours. You get into after hours by grabbing a copy of the book from some of the links that we've been putting in chat. Uh, get a copy of the book from the bookstall. They'll send you a registration link. Uh, after hours is a lot of fun. It's uh, it's a Zoom meeting. So cameras are on. You can ask your own questions. It's very lively. So Steve will be there. Eric will be there. Um, it's a great time. So Support the bookstall, support Eric and his new book and come hang out with us. We'd love to see you. So uh, we have um, some great questions here, uh, kind of riffing a little bit, Eric, with where you left off. Um, and let me grab her name. Hold on, I, I almost had her name and then I lost her name. Give me one more second. Uh, okay, Adrian asks, um, my 10 year old autistic son is watching this with me and he keeps saying, I agree, he's right. He oh, recently God, took it. I know he recently took an opportunity in class when there was an autistic character, when there was an autistic character in a book to explain autism to a friend who asked, what is autism? And so maybe a little bit of a, it's a slightly different question than what you were just answering. What advice would you give him as he tries to help his classmates understand how he sees the world? That, um, that it doesn't, again, I said, you know, the playground has diagnostic labels just as much as clinicians do, but that doesn't mean, but that you want to be included, you know, 
that you want to belong and that they that you have just as much right to belong and that also again you want to be their friend and my the way that i express my friendship with my friends and the way i express love with my friends or when i date when i've had girlfriends girlfriends may be different than other than how neurotypicals express it but that doesn't mean that i don't have something to offer and that doesn't mean that i don't want to do the best that i can and it also means that if you understand me, if you take the message time, if you take the time to understand me, then you'll recognize that there is a that there is a human, that there is an essence to you, that there is more to you. That that I don't want to say that there's more to you than the autism because the autism is an integral part of you, but that there is, but that it is a completely different and unique experience, and that it is just as good and it is just as valid. One of the fast, one of the things that I would, and what I would also say is that like. You know, I know plenty of autistic people who are husbands and wives and spouses and parents. And you know what? They are fantastic at that. And you know, I like to think I'm a pretty good friend. So, you know, just say that like we express ourselves and we express our affection and we may be friends in a different way, but it can be just as incredible as being friends with a neurotypical, you know? Okay, good. I'm gonna go with, um, here's the most popular question of the night from Taylor is asking, I would love to know about your thoughts on types of therapies typically, quote, prescribed, unquote, to autistic people. Mm. Specifically, ABA is almost universally recommended very strongly yeah. to parents of autistic children in the same breath as they receive the diagnosis. However, yeah. it seems incredibly controversial in the art autistic community, but many parents are feeling stuck with therapies that may or may not be the best for autistic people. Do you have experience with these and or recommendations? So I didn't go through ABA, I should say. I should put that out front. Uh, but what I should say is that this is a perfect example of how policy can both improve people's lives, but also how it can trap people. The fact of the matter is, is that a lot of states, that's the only treatment that, ought, that's the only quote unquote treatment or the only uh, therapy that insurance companies will cover. So there is an incentive for clinicians and things like this to say, okay, here's ABA, you know, because that's what, that's the only thing that, that they'll cover. And I think that again, it, but plenty of autistic people have said that it is like conditioning. They've said that it is, you know, some have said it's like torture. Uh, some have said that like, you know, it's, it's it, and I think the, the other big problem is that ABA focuses less on, a lot of times it focuses less on um, what autistic people really need and more about making them appear more neurotypical or have more neurotypical traits. Um, I understand that impulse, but I also think that it's more, I, I don't even begrudge parents who like might be suckered into, or, or, might, or not necessarily suckered in, but might be convinced to take, to, to, to use that, because if that's the only option that's available, then of course you're going to take it. And especially if, you know, that's the only thing that insurance is going to cover, then I completely understand how that could happen. But at the same time, I think what needs to happen is that there needs to be, even the Department of Defense just put out a whole report saying that it's, uh, I'm sure Steve, you remember, you saw this, like the Pentagon just put out a whole thing saying that like, it's not the most effective thing. And now there's people trying to advocate for, the military is a lot of things, but they don't like repeating the same mistakes, you know? It's exactly. Uh, uh, I say this as uh, as the grandson of a paratrooper who fought in World War II, you know, that, uh, and and plenty of plenty of friends with plenty of veterans. You know, the fact that the Pentagon is saying that you know through the health insurance coverage that it's not the most effective comprehensive thing might mean that we might want to look at another thing. So I understand why parents might be convinced to it, but again, there needs to be more uh, research into other types of uh, therapies and you know ways to help autistic people. And uh, let me just jump in briefly. Um, I want to recommend uh, for parents who feel that their children are having challenging behavior, they don't know if they, you know, need to do ABA, which is often the only thing offered to them, as you said, I would also recommend a book called Uniquely Human by Barry Prezant, who practices a different form of therapy called CERTS, which is much more respectful of the autistic individual. Um, it's he's, he's a great guy. He runs parents retreats every year and it's a fantastic book we our books came out the same month and we immediately recognized that they were sister books sort of yeah all right okay. we'll, see, we'll see if Anne marie can get that uh Anne marie that last name is p-r-i-z-a-n-t maybe she can pop that link in before yeah. we got about three minutes left here uh for those just as a one i want to make sure i get in this next question 
Can you give the 30 second definition for those who are more new to this? What is ABA? Uh, I realize folks within uh, the autism- Applied behavioral analysis, which okay. is a type of uh, treatment, I guess you can see that uses incremental types of treatment and uses, and it's very much in the behaviorist school okay. of psychiatry. Is that, Steve, you know more about the science. Is that yes, it's, it's behaviorism. So you reward desirable behavior, you punish undesirable behavior, which is often, you know, ways that autistic people soothe themselves, for instance. Yeah. So. All, right, thank you. All right, Kaylee asks, I'd love to hear you talk about your research on the need for more research advocacy and resources for Hispanic Latinx autistics. As a Latino autistic myself, I think we need more representation in the autistic movement. Thank you for saying that. And I agree, not just because I'm Latino. Uh, I think that it's important because there's a big language gap. And the problem is that the diagnostic tools are done with English speakers in mind. So I think that there needs to be an update or at least it's going to be like, it'll be difficult because naturally, like anytime you kind of graft something onto any kind of tools, you know, it's kind of a kludge. Uh, but I think that that's definitely something that needs to be done is that for ESL Latino communities, that definitely needs to be taken into consideration. Even in places like California, where there's a large Latino community or Latinx community, it still is a big problem. Even in places like, you know, Evans, Illinois, or like Park Ridge, there are, play, there, there are Mexicans there, you know. Um, yes, there are. Uh, so, so uh, you know, you know, and there, there are Puerto Ricans in Pennsylvania. So, um, so th th that's the other thing I think that there needs to be more research in how do we get, how do we deal with the language gap? And also how do we deal with cultural attitudes towards autism and the lack of knowledge within a lot of these communities? Because a lot of parents just don't know how to spot these traits or they might just blend more naturally into, you know, different cultures, you know, just, you know, just naturally. So I think that's the other thing. I should say that I am as assimilated as hell. I am 30 generation American. Uh, I was born in a largely Jewish neighborhood in Skokie, and I lived in the suburbs, you know, with picket fences. So like, uh, so, so I can't speak to all that, but, th but that definitely needs to be looked into. Uh, and that you put in a thing, how can I purchase the book? If you open up the chat, I don't know if you have chat open on the zoom, we've been posting links all night uh, to the book stall. If for some reason you haven't had chat open, then you're not going to see that link. Anne Marie, can you maybe throw it in one more time in case somebody did not have chat open? Um, okay, I want to get to this question um, right here because it's it, it was asked in various ways um, on the registration form that folks are putting it in. What are your thoughts on the associate? And we're this will probably be ah, last question for sure. So let's make it tight. What are your thoughts on the association between uh, ASD and ADHD? Um, I have both. So you know. A lot of times, I think for uh, Kramer and Ronsky, for a long time, they didn't think that that was possible. But, uh, but I think, but yeah, plenty of times, you know, those two things can exist within the same person. And then a lot of times, you know, I know people who are autistic who are married to people with ADHD. So, you know, there's, you know, some kinship there. And a lot of times they, they, they may, they read from the same hymn book, so to speak, as my late Christian grandmother would say, you know. So. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much for thank a you. great night. You gave thank great you. value to the fan community. We're really, really grateful to have hosted. Reminder, uh, we are going to be starting after hours in about five minutes. Steve and Eric, I know you know where your join link is. And so go ahead and take a quick five minute break. Thank you everyone for coming. Come hang out on Thursday with Dr. Brindell and Ryan Steltzer. Got a lot of great programming coming this fall. So thanks everybody for tuning in. And Thank we'll you, Lonnie. So Thank great you to so see you. so much to everybody. Thank, Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>